Jim Lang, our presenter today, is a nationally recognized IRA, Roth IRA, and 401k expert whose tax and estate planning strategies have been endorsed by the Wall Street Journal 36 times. His insights have also been featured in numerous publications, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, Forbes, Reader's Digest, Bottom Line, and Kiplinger's. He's a paid contributor to Forbes com and his peer-reviewed articles have appeared in Trust and Estates Magazine, Financial Planning, The Tax Advisor, and the Journal for Retirement Planning. Jim is the author of nine best-selling books that help protect the financial security of IRA owners and their families, and you'll receive a free hardcover copy of both of his latest books, Retire Secure for Professors and TIAA Participants, and Retire Secure for Parents of a Child with a Disability as a part of this workshop today. If you haven't already received those two bonuses and any of the other bonus uh, books that you would like to take, at the end of this session, not at the break, but at the end of the session, we'll have all of that out on the table again. Um, Jim is a well-known Roth IRA expert who authored actually the first peer-reviewed article on Roth IRAs in 1998, and that was published in the AICPA's journal, The Tax Advisor. Jim also developed Lang's Cascading Beneficiary Plan, an estate plan that provides ma maximum flexibility for married IRA and retirement plan owners. His books, including Retire Secure, The Roth Revolution, Beating the New Death Tax, and The $214,000 Mistake, How to Double Your Social Security and Maximize Your IRAs, have become classics and are endorsed by some of the country's top experts, including Charles Schwab, the late Larry King, Jane Bryant Quinn, Roger Ibbotson, Ed Slott, Larry Kotlikoff, Larry Swedro, Stephen Leinberg, and Burton Malkiel. Prior to the sale of the law firm to the longtime lead attorney, Matt Schwartz, last fall, Jim and our team at Lang Legal Group had drafted over 3,000 wills and trusts. Our accounting firm prepares 760 tax returns each year, and in conjunction with our money management partners, our RIA oversees over $900 million in assets under management. As a member of the team here at Lang, I've had an opportunity to get a real great behind the scenes look at just how much Jim cares about putting a lot of great and super topically relevant and cutting edge information into these presentations. And this estate planning presentation today is no exception. So without further ado, I'll let him get straight to it. Please welcome Jim Lang. Thank you. Um, Erica's right. I did make changes yesterday, but I don't spend time to make it real pretty and we usually have somebody that does that. And she was busy. E Erica, don't go away, I'm talking about you. Erica, was, Erica got three hours of sleep last night because she did it personally. So thank you, Erica. <laughs> okay, so this morning we were, even though there was a lot of estate planning in it, it was presumably the living part. This session is about the dying part which for a lot of reasons might be as important or more important than even the living part. And what we're gonna talk about is what I believe is the best estate plan for most IRA and retirement, most married IRA and retirement plan owners from if you have, let's call it a traditional marriage. We're gonna talk about the cost of potentially doing nothing. Uh, we're gonna talk about the details of this plan that I think is going to make a lot of sense, I think when I first learned about it, I thought, why isn't everybody doing this? Or at least a lot of people. It's just going to make so much intuitive sense to you. Um, I think that you're really going to like it. And a lot of you, I think, are going to want to change your documents um, after you hear it. We're going to talk about, um, so I have a number of people who have been following me for years he, he, here today. We're going to talk about something, it's not based on changes in the tax law, it's based on something that I figured out relatively recently. I've never seen it anywhere in practice, and I think it's also going to make a lot of sense for you, and for some of you, I think you're actually going to implement it. Um, we call it Who Gets What. Um, we're gonna talk about controlling from the grave. 
which is a very interesting concept, which is much more possible, uh, which is not nearly as difficult as many of you think. Again, the best plan, and we're gonna talk about the best plan after the SECURE Act and SECURE 2.0. Um, talk about the concepts, talk about um, why it is so well revered. It's been in the multi Wall Street Journal multiple times. They did it early on, and then they did it like five years later. Okay, you know, what was the result of, you know, them publishing it and, and how, how's it worked in practice? The short answer is exceedingly well. And then we're gonna talk about trusts. And we're gonna talk about some of the trusts that you might not have even thought about. We're not gonna just talk about avoiding probate. We're gonna, this is kind of the advanced class. So we're gonna talk about some particular uses of trusts and how so many attorneys screw this up. But we don't want your attorney to screw this up, even if it ends up being um, recommended by me. And then, of course, the solution. So we talked about some of the income tax acceleration. Remember those two graphs for the people who were here? You know, this is where your kid is gonna be, which was zero um, under the new law, and this is where your kid was under the old law, and then some of the things that we could do about it. Um, but we're also gonna talk about some of the estate planning differences um, and the exceptions to the SECURE Act was if you're leaving your money to your spouse, if you are leaving money to a qualified charitable trust, if you're leaving your money to somebody who is more than 10 years younger than you, uh, I'm sorry, within 10 years of your life, which is most likely um, an unmarried partner or a sibling. And we're gonna talk about, actually we're not gonna talk about it, but I'll ju I'm just gonna put in a little note about it. Um, if you have a child with a disability, or if you know somebody that has a child with a disability, it is mission critical to get them the book that I just finished, which is called Retire Secure for Parents with a Child with a Disability. Um, our daughter developed a, a condition called dysautonomia. She will never be able to work, um, but it will not likely affect her life expectancy. So I have to provide for her, for my not only my and my wife's life, but maybe for 40 years on top of that. Um, I think I have the best solution. My background was perfect. I got, I got together dream partners and wrote what we believe is the best resource. Um, and even if you don't have a child with a disability, if you know somebody that does, I'll give you as many books as you want. Um, that's kind of a non-financial mission um, to get that in people's hands. Um, so let's talk about some of the problems with estate planning. And one of the big problems is we just don't know what's gonna happen in the future. You know, if we knew exactly what was gonna happen, when you were gonna die, how much money you had, what the tax laws were like, what, where your, your kids were living, where you're living, all these things, it would be a lot easier to draft an estate plan and to maximize it. But we can't do that, because we just don't know. We don't know what the law is gonna be like. We, we have a radical change in how IRAs are treated at death than we did just four years ago. So if we did a stone plan, you would have had to have come in and changed your will again four years ago. And then there's another change, and if we do a fixed in stone plan, you're gonna to have to keep changing and changing and changing, and then your portfolio goes up, you have to change, your portfolio goes down. You know, all these laws, I, you know, it's kind of like the, um, <clears throat> the estate attorney's uh, college tuition plan for their kids, because that's what you would have to do if you're gonna maximize, and that's not what people do in the real world. In the real world, they, they're just so happy to get it done. Usually they get it done, it sits for years. Who's gonna die first? Usually we assume the guy is because we, we men live uh, shorter life expectancies than spouses. But if you plan on that and then your, your spouse, traditionally the female, um, dies first, then maybe the estate plan is must, messed up. Well, how do you provide for that? That's one uncertainty. What are the needs of the survivors? 
you, you know, you might have different kids with different needs. You know, they might be living in different states. You might be living in different, a different state. You know, so I've been doing this for 40 years. So I'd say that the general age range in this room, yeah, I know there's some variation, but that's kind of my audience. But that was also true 35 years ago. Well, I've kind of gone through the life process with these folks. And a lot of people who always assumed that they would live and die in Pennsylvania now find themselves in different states because that's where their kids went. I have, a, I have a client and she says, I hate Florida. Florida's just everything I don't like. And guess where she's living? Yeah, so we just don't know. Um, we don't know where you're gonna die. We don't know the laws of the state of either where you're gonna die or what the laws ought for are on your survivor. So we have all these issues and we don't want you to have to keep coming to the estate attorney every time that there is a change in one of these things. And you know, you know from the first session, if you, if you were here, if you're not, we love to run the numbers. We love to do projections. And we've done thousands of them. And I will tell you, guess what? Every single one of them was wrong. <laughs> Isn't that a great thing to tell potential prospects? Everything we've ever done is wrong. Because something other than what we thought was going to happen, happened. We thought the husband was going to die first, the wife died first. We thought they were going to die a Pennsylvania resident. They ended up dying a Florida resident. They thought their, their kid was going to be in Pennsylvania, the kid's in California. We thought, all the, we thought the mark was going to go up, but went down. We thought it was going to go down. Everything we've done, I'm not saying we shouldn't do them anyway, but you, you're not going to be able to nail it, particularly for a, um, a long term. Um, why don't we figure out a plan that will work even if all these changes do, do occur, or many of them do occur? Would, it, would that be a good thing to come up with a plan? Oh, oh let's see, the, the assets went up, but I don't have to change my estate plan. Oh, they went down, but I don't have to change my estate plan. Oh, I moved to Florida, but oh, I don't have to change my estate plan. Oh, the one kid did that. Wouldn't that be a lot better than either doing a fixed in stone plan that's gonna be wrong, or even the traditional documents that just by the changes of one of these things, it might not quote be wrong, but it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be getting the most for your family. Okay, which is obviously what I want. So let's talk about first who this plan is for. So by a show of hands, could you raise your hand if you're married? All right, please keep your hand up if you are married and you have at least one child. Please keep your hand up if you are married, have at least one child, and your spouse is also the parent of that same child. Okay, so everybody that ha has their hand up, including me, um, and I think everybody here is old enough to know my uh, reference, um, is what I call a leave it to beaver family or if you want to go even further back, Ozzie and Harriet. Original husband, original wife, an in common child, okay? Not a child from a previous marriage, not the love child from the 60s, plain old, and you know, and there's less and less of us as, as not only as we age, but as the country changes with a 50% divorce rate. And my clients have a way less than 50% divorce rate. There are obviously solutions for people who are not of this leave it to beaver. Many of the concepts will still apply, but right now specifically, I'm gonna be talking to the people who have these leave it to beaver type marriages, even though the concepts will apply to other people. Okay. Um, let me ask you this. Would you say that if you are married and you're in this traditional marriage, would you say that your first goal, your first estate planning goal is to provide for your spouse? Yeah. Would you say that your, oops, I missed, um, provide for both of you while you're still alive, then, then your spouse. <laughs> Um, all right, and then let's assume that your spouse is provided for. 
is the next goal to cut taxes and to maximize what your kids would get. And then if there's some reason that doesn't make sense to leave money to the kids, would, it, would the next person or next group um, in line be your grandkids? Okay, so basically, subject to exception obviously, the general rule is spouse first, kids second, grandkids, typically trust for grandkids third. All right, so that's our general rule. Well, what are some of the advantages of leaving it to your spouse? Well, we love our spouse. We want to provide for our spouse. Um, in the traditional marriage, our spouse is going to presumably leave money to our mutual kids at his or her death. We, the spouse is one of the exceptions to the income tax acceleration of the SECURE Act, so that's very cool, meaning that they're going to have a much lower minimum required distribution than if you leave an IRA or a retirement plan to your child. So there's a lot of tax advantages. There's no transfer tax either at the federal level or the Pennsylvania level. You can thank Governor Ridge for that. Um, I was practicing when there was a um, there was both a tax on leaving money to your spouse and there was a tax on leaving money at the federal level and at the state level. Now there's an unlimited marital for federal and state, which is very cool. So that's, that's good. Um, no estate tax, no inheritance tax, old favorable treatment. Um, if you do a Roth IRA conversion that we talked about this morning, your spouse doesn't have a minimum required distribution of the Roth IRA, if you have, if you convert to a Roth, or you contributed to a Roth, you die, you leave it to your spouse. No minimum required distribution for your spouse. So that's a lot of good reasons to leave it to your spouse. Well, there might be some reasons that you might want to leave maybe part of your money to your kids at the first death. Maybe your kids are in a much lower income tax bracket than your spouse. And we can save some taxes by having directing some money to the kids at the first death, okay? Um, maybe the kid needs the money and they need it more now than when the survivor of the two of you dies. So that might be a good reason to have some money going to the kids. Um, and there might be some reasons why you might want some money to go to the grandkids. Maybe Maybe your kid is in a profession, profession where they could easily get sued. You know, maybe they design playgrounds or something. Well, and maybe they have their own money. So you might want to skip a generation or you might want to have some money going to grandkids to pay for education or whatever that might be. So there might be good reasons to have money, A, go to the spouse, B, go to children, C, go to grandchildren. Um, so, oh, another good reason. The no good son-in-law, all right? <laughs> by the way, there's a bunch of you who should not play poker because I can tell just by looking who some of you who have either no good sons-in-law, same thing for no good daughter-in-laws. I'm not trying to be sexist about this. But many of us don't want to die, leave money to our kid, our kid gets divorced, and then your good money goes to your, your future ex-son or daughter-in-law. Meaning they're not, right now they're your daughter-in-law or son-in-law, but this would be money goes to them after you're dead and after your child divorces them and they get part of your inheritance as part of the marital settlement. And it happens, believe me, it happens. Um, nobody wants that. Um, by the way, there's another solution for that. And we even have a name for it. It's called um, the I don't want my no good son-in-law to inherit one red cent of my money trust. And that has become much more popular in recent years. Um, you think I'm kidding, I'm really not. We draft these things and, and um, it's a, it, the other way to do it is a, is a prenuptial agreement, but sometimes that doesn't work and sometimes it's too late because they're already married. And one, you bring up the, the issue of a postnuptial agreement after your child is married, that's a great way to start a family fight. And I have done that. 
and I have at least one divorce who claims that it's my fault because I recommended to my client that their kid get a postnuptial agreement. And when it was presented to the daughter-in-law, she wasn't too happy. They fought and they went their separate ways. I suspect that they would have gone their separate ways anyway, but they said that that was it. Um, and by the way, we also have, at the risk of generalizing based on race, there are certain races that are really resistant to prenuptial agreements. So you might even have an ethnic reason why that doesn't go, and, and even family regardless of ethnicity. So how are we going to decide when there's advantages of leaving it to spouse, to kids and children, and how, how, how can we do this if we don't want to just keep going to the attorney all the time? Ready for this? We're, we're not going to decide. Well, that's pretty easy, right? We're just not going to decide. OK, good. We're done, right? We're not going to decide. But we want to set in place a mechanism so that even though me and my spouse or you and your spouse aren't going to decide now who gets what, we're going to put in a provision that your spouse gets to decide not now, but within nine months of your death. Wouldn't that be much better? So let's say that you do these documents now and both of you survive, say, 10, 15, 20 years or two years or whatever it is. A lot of those what ifs that we don't know now, where are you going to live, how much money you're going to have, what's the tax situation, where are your kids, all that situation. All that is going to be much more clear after the first death. And if, if you do have this leave it to beaver marriage and you have the same kids and your spouse is going to presumably leave money to the same end beneficiary as you, which is going to be your kids, maybe grandkids, wouldn't it be better if they decided with all that additional information? Because they can make a better decision later than you can now. Oh, Jim, I'm, I'm the money guy in the family. I like to make those decisions. Well, if you have a kid, your kid can help your spouse. Presumably, the estate attorney who set this up can provide information. And having done this for 40 years, I'll tell you what happens. The surviving spouse typically doesn't come into the office alone. They come in with, with one of the, the adult kids. And you might already know which kid is going to be in the room, you know, if we're going to be honest about it. Um, you have nine months to make that decision. So it's not like, oh, he died yesterday. I have to decide in a week. No, you have nine months. You get the advice, if you, assuming you want, of the estate attorney of our office if you're working with us um, and your child. Decisions are made, paperwork is filed, and you end up with a typically a much better plan than if you tried to say everything that's going to happen in stone while you're both alive. And particularly, if there was a long period between the first and the second death. It's just a better plan. We've been, so I learned about, it wasn't my idea. I read about it. It was kind of in an obscure magazine. And it, it was written by a state attorney in Virginia. And I thought it was just so cool. And I was looking, the, the article didn't have the language. And I was interested in the language because I wanted to implement it. And I, I, I called the guy. <laughs> and I remember he had a thick southern draw. Son, are you going to draft this flexible estate plan for your clients, you better know what to do after one of them dies. And he was right. But luckily, that's, that's my strong area. You know, I'm quantitative. I'm a chess player. I'm a bridge player. We've been running numbers for a long time. So that part was the easy part. I, I just needed the language. Anyway, we finally developed the language. Erica mentioned that we drafted roughly 3,000 wills. Well, we've had a lot of deaths in the last 35 years using the exact plan that I'm recommending, all right? 
it has worked out exceedingly well. We have saved people a ton of money. When the laws changed, did they have to go back and change it? No, they didn't. So this is a proven system. When I did that first article, for the first peer review article for the American Institute of CPAs, the tax advisor, and it was mainly about IRAs and Roth IRA conversions, and then I was doing this estate plan that hardly anybody was doing. I just thought, ah, for the heck of it, I'll throw this in, I'll see if I can slip it by, and the peer reviewers might like it. They'll probably throw it out. They're gonna say, hey, we're, we're tax, we're not estate planning. They loved it. They actually wanted me to put more details in it. Um, I did an article. Um, it was just kind of a blog for my newsletter. And I got a call, hi, this is Jane Brian Quinn. Oh, I'm sorry, Jane, I'm too busy to talk to you. No, I didn't do that. The, the call did come in after hours. We spent over the next two weeks, I'm gonna say four to six hours on the phone. She did a one page article in Newsweek. That's old fashioned journalism. Four to six hours, one page. She was terrific. She's still alive, um, but she is retired. Jonathan Clemens, I think we did about 34 articles together in the Wall Street Journal. He was old school too. And, and the other thing that both of them did, which hardly anybody does today, is they checked with me before they published it to make sure that they got it right. Um, you know, and I, I still deal with the press, and I hate when I am misquoted, which unfortunately happens a lot. And I beg the people, oh, please, you know, see it before it goes out. Because A, I don't want it to go out wrong, and especially if my name is associated with it. And the other thing is it doesn't make the author look good. You know, the article that I did for Forbes by Ashley Eberling. Ashley's really a smart woman, and she's with the Wall Street Journal now, and she's really good, but believe me, I, every word of that article was very well reviewed before it went out, and that's the way it should be. Um, so how do we do this solution where you don't decide now? And let's assume that we're gonna use the same order that we just all agreed on. Spouse first, kids next, trust for grandkids third. Okay, so we're gonna, I wanna introduce some of you who have actually been with me know about this, and some of you who who haven't been with me, it's not like I'm the only estate attorney to use it. And it's called a, a disclaimer. All right, so what is a disclaimer? Nobody can force you to accept a bequest. All right, so let's say you're the surviving spouse. Your spouse just died. Let's just keep it simple. One clause, I leave $100,000 to my spouse. And the spouse says, I don't want it. What happens then? Does the spouse get to say, oh, it goes to here, it goes to my kid, it goes to the gardener, it goes... No, the spouse doesn't get to decide. The spouse gets to decide, do I want it? Do I want part of it? Do I want all of it? Let's, for this example, keep it simple. No, I don't want that 100,000. So what, what do we do then? We see who's next in line. Oh, if my spouse disclaims any part of this, it goes to kids equally. If any of my kids disclaim their share, it goes to their kids. And by the way, not all the grandkids. So let's keep it simple. Here's you, here's your spouse, you have two kids. Each of them have two kids, all right? So first you're naming your spouse. And if your spouse says they don't want it, Typically, we're gonna have language called disclaimer language. If I don't want it, it goes to these two, okay? Then we further have disclaimer language for these two. So let's say this one doesn't want it. He doesn't want it to go to his nieces and nephews. He wants it to go to his kids. So if this one disclaims, it goes into well-drafted trust for their benefits. And by the way, if this one disclaims and he's still alive, we can make him the trustee. Where in traditional documents, the only way these guys are gonna get any money is if this one's dead. So we're adding two levels of additional options to the estate plan, and we're doing this while you're both alive. 
And I will tell you, having drafted so many of these and having gone through the estate administration process with so many people, this ends up having huge benefits to the family. All right. And um, this goes by different names. If you read it about it in my literature, it's called, no, if you read, I'm sorry, if you read about it in the Snooty Peer Review Journal, or you go to the Wall Street Journal, or you go to some other areas, it's known as the Cascading Beneficiary Plan. The cascade from parent to kids to grandkids. If you read about it in my stuff, I call it Lang's Cascading Beneficiary Plan. And I'm not saying I'm the first guy to use disclaimers, but I'm the first guy who put a system to it and named it. And I think it makes sense for a lot of people. Spouse dies, leaves it to the spouse. Spouse says no thanks, goes to the kid. Kid says no thanks, goes to the grandkid. Um, okay, so, oh, this, this, is a, this is a true story, by the way. I always change the facts considerably for confidentiality and also to keep it simple. So husband and wife have six million bucks, all right? They're not spenders, surprise, surprise. Um, first spouse dies with these disclaimer provisions. And the surviving spouse says, hmm, I have six million bucks. All I really need is maybe two million, maybe not even that. Let's add a buffer, three million. So we want the spouse to keep three million, but what happens to the other three million? She disclaims it. Where does it go? To the three kids equally, okay? Um, so, let's see. Each kid gets a million bucks. By the way, each kid did something differently. One, he started maxing out his retirement plan and his spouse's retirement plan, did some other things that had long-term benefits, and then spent some money too, to be fair. Um, the other one said, hey, I have more than enough money. I'm gonna disclaim this into the trust that mom and dad drafted for my kids. So we're talking serious generational wealth here. Um, the other one bought a beach house, uh, which is great. But they got the beach house 10 years earlier than they would have had they had to wait for the second spouse to die. We saved a ton of money in taxes. And it worked, just worked out so beautifully for the family. Um, by the way, sometimes I get ahead of the slide, so when I'm going forward, I'm not skipping stuff. I just already said it. Um, okay, but without these disclaimers, all these benefits to the family would not have happened. And again, we've been, this isn't like Wild Bill Hickok, you know, with this brand new crazy scheme. No, I've been doing this for, I hate to say it, but more than 35 years. And we've had a lot of deaths. And by the way, our strategies changed a lot. So in the old days, when the, before the SECURE Act, when the kids could stretch the inherited IRA over their lifetime, we were very anxious to disclaim IRA money to the kids and better yet, to the grandkids, because they, they got such a great income tax deferral. Or better yet, tax-free inherited Roth deferral. Well, now it doesn't make sense to disclaim IRA money to kids unless they meet one of the exceptions because the kid can only take it out. The kid's going to have to pay tax on the whole thing in 10 years. So now if we want money to go into kids, we typically disclaim after-tax dollars. Same documents. We didn't have to change the documents, but we can change the strategy. And that has worked very, very well since... 2020, but we would make significant, with the identical documents, we would make significantly different recommendations if you died on December 31 
2019, or if you died on January 1, 2020. Much different recommendations. So we've preserved flexibility, okay? And if you like that idea, then don't just do it in your wills or your trust, but do it for everything. Your IRAs, your 401ks, your 403bs, annuities, the house, after-tax dollars, pre-tax dollars. That way you're giving your spouse and the estate attorney more tools to benefit the family. So it's really a system. Now, sometimes people want certain things to go to, their, to certain beneficiaries no matter what. And, you know, I get it, that's fine. But if we can be flexible, we can, we can save a lot of money and get money going to the right places at the right times. And it just makes a huge, huge difference. And again, not Wild Bill Hickok type stuff, proven system. Other state attorneys do it, frankly. And I'd like to say, oh, they read my articles, they read my books, then every, the whole change, the, it, it, no, but what happened is more and more state attorneys realize, oh, this is a good system. I'll take a little credit, but it, it, it does work. It does work. Again, for wills, revocable trust, IRA, beneficiary designations, uh, Roth IRAs, annuities, etc. And in the old days, the surviving spouse would disclaim the IRA. Now the surviving spouse disclaims the after-tax dollars. Okay. Um, questions about this before I go on? Yes, sir. <coughs> Of, uh, generation skipping taxation, how that would come into play here? Yeah, the, the, uh, by the way, since I'm an attorney, I'm allowed to take any question and answer any other question. Um, <laughs> we might have a few political candidates that like to do that too. Um, the, the question, if, if I can rephrase, is can this potentially work for generation skipping tax? Because in the old days, what happened is somebody would. If you left it here, let's say you were the Mellons and you left everything here, there was a big estate tax. These kids still had a lot of money. Now when they died, there was another estate tax. So sometimes people would skip this generation and there was a special estate tax called the generation skipping tax. And is this a potential way to avoid that? And the answer is yes. Um, by the way, transfer taxes have become less prevalent than in the old days. In the old days, we only had a $600,000 exclusion, and that was transfer tax, not income tax. Those two different things. You know, we have the, the, fruit, the fruit and the tree. If either during your lifetime or at death, you give somebody the tree, that's a transfer tax. If you give them the fruit from the tree, that's an income tax. Okay? So two different, you know, they're really two different tax systems. One is a transfer tax, one is an income tax. And in the old days, there were a lot more transfer tax problems. And today, the biggest tax issue, particularly if you have a big IRA or 401k or 403b at Keo, the bigger problem is income tax. We all have a Pennsylvania transfer tax problem, but that's only 4.5% for lineal heirs. So it's not big like the federal estate, which is you know 40%. Okay. Other questions on the cascading beneficiary plan? By the way, does it make sense to you? Yeah. Um, so we used to, you know, I, I stole the firm, but I can still make rec recommendations on who the, on who, depending on your situation, would be an appropriate estate attorney for you. Because frankly, some of the stuff that we do, we can have more of an impact if we control the will and the estate plan than just doing the living part. 
And, you know, it's, it's even though I sold the firm, it's not like I forgot everything about drafting wills and trusts that I've learned in 35 years. So, and to me, I have to get it right. And, and part of what is going to, and I am, by the way, surprise, surprise, I'm gonna make an offer at the end of this. Uh, part of that includes me personally and potentially one other estate attorney taking a hard look at your current plan and then tell you what's wrong with it. Because I will tell you there is a very small chance if we didn't draft your documents that I'm gonna be happy with whoever did. And I don't care if you went to the best a state attorney there is. I don't care if you went to my old boss at people with the people at Buchanan Ingersoll, and they, you know, very good firm, um, or even if you had some of the planning done at Arthur Anderson, which is where I worked. Um, that's how I worked my way through law school. There are two questions. Why don't we start with Pothan? Can, can the uh, surviving spouse disclaim uh, part of the assets? Okay, can, very good question. Thank you. Can you have a partial disclaimer? Well, yes, in fact, that's what typically happens. You know, let's say there's a million dollars and the spouse says, well, I want to keep 500,000 of it. I disclaim 500,000. And I, I would say not only can you, I would say in practice that happens much more frequently than an entire disclaimer. In that is after the first death, uh, part of the assets will go to the descendant like the son or daughter. Whatever. Right, and not only is it different, different dollar amounts, but different assets. Okay, so we might have, in the old days, we, we tried to get IRAs to kids and grandkids. Today, since the income taxes are so miserable for kids and grandkids, we try to get IRAs to spouse, and then after-tax dollars to kids and grandkids. Is it, uh, advice, is it advisable to, to uh, distribute the uh, uh, Roth IRA to uh, to, the, to the son or daughter, rather than the wife? Um, in general, no. The question is, should, should you disclaim Roth dollars? Because remember, the spouse doesn't have a minimum required distribution. So why not get, let's say that she survives you by 10 years, why not get another 10 years of tax-free growth with no minimum required distribution? Assuming other money is available for your kids. Okay, there was a, yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> If the IRA has its own beneficiary list. Um, does the IRA have its own beneficiary? If, if it does, you know, who gets what from the IRA? Uh, why do you recommend that the IRA be placed into the trust? Uh, the, well, first thing, I don't recommend the IRA be placed into a trust. If you take an IRA, let's say your name is Joe Schmo and you transfer it to the Joe Schmo Trust, Guess what you just caused? Income tax acceleration of the entire IRA. And by the way, it's been done. So that's outside the trust act. Right, so the IRA, the, the, this is one of the mistakes, by the way, this is a preview, is not getting the beneficiary designation of the IRA right. And that happens so often. And I blame the estate attorney. But you know, people come in, they have this 40-page will, and it has all these contingencies, blah, blah, blah. And then I look at the IRA beneficiary designation. Spouse first, kids equally second. Well, where's most of your money? Oh, it's in my IRA. So let me understand this. Most of your money in your IRA is controlled by a two-line beneficiary designation, sometimes three-line. And the, the minority of your money is controlled by this 40-page trust that has what if, what if, what if, what if. Well, that's not smart. Your, the beneficiary, the, your IRA goes to the beneficiary that you laid out as part of the beneficiary designation of the IRA, or 401k, or 403b, et cetera. A lot of attorneys let the clients fill that out. I wouldn't let a client fill it out. I'm not gonna let my beautiful plan screwed up by a client who is trying to save $10 by not having the estate attorney do what they do. You know, if a, if, if a client said, hey, I'm trying to save money, I'll fill out my own beneficiary designation, I would say I'd rather not work with you. I, I really don't. I mean, to me, you know, I love to have plans, but in order to get all the planning right, you need to plan right before you die you have to have the planning right at the first death, and you have to have the planning right at the second death. 
You know, this is, this is a system. And at any one of these points, if you screw it up, and a lot of times, you know, we're talking about real money here. You know, one of my, one of my problems is I tend to, I kind of be intellectual about this stuff, and I talk about the money, and oh, you save your kids a million bucks, you save them a half a billion dollars, you do this, you do, well, this is actually changing people's lives. There's a big difference between your kid having 1.5 million and your kid running out of money. Now, that might sound like 1.5 million, but the reality is, if you're broke and you have expenses, you're miserable. Well, what if that could have been prevented by just being smart? You know, about the Roth IRAs, gifting, everything else. So, I mean, it, I kind of forget about that. Now, since I'm doing a lot of work for parents of a child with a disability like mine, the impact of getting it wrong is much worse. So let's say I do your plan and I screw it up and we could have saved your family a half a million dollars, but I screwed it up. Well, it's bad, but if your kid doesn't have a disability, I wouldn't call it tragic. Sometimes for some families, it is tragic if it doesn't happen right. And I would tell you the majority of the time, most of what I see, it's, it's just miserable. And I blame advisors and and their um, estate attorneys. That's why I only work with a couple advisors. And by the way, it's not just because, and, and the advisors I work with, um, again, could you raise your hand? If, and if you wanna talk, um, I encourage you to do so at the break and afterwards. And I can talk all about them, how good they are, and they do asset location, they, that's the same we do, and blah, blah, blah. They're not gonna be Vanguard by 4%, but they're, they're smart, and they, they know all this stuff. So it makes a difference. But anyway, yes. Let's put them back to your example where the, the surviving spouse <clears throat> just claimed half and then, the, and so say she or he took three mil and then they died and there's 1.5 mil left. That is just a straightforward line in the same will that says, and then once the secondary spouse dies, what's left is to be distributed to the kids equally. Yes. Okay. And then secondly, just a matter of curiosity, is there something magical about nine months? Uh, all right, so, right, and, and interestingly, that tends to be an issue of state law, not federal law. So why did I say the disclaimer's deadline has to be within nine months of the date of death? That's because, and I never want to say anything about Louisiana that uses the Napoleonic Code. I, I, please don't die. I have one client who's rich and they, no, Louisiana, it's, oh, it's misery. But forgetting about Louisiana, I believe all the 49 other states, because again, we don't know where we're gonna die, um, says the disclaimer has to be in nine months. So let's say for discussion's sake, is that your husband next to you? All right, so let's say, I'm, I'm just gonna pick on him. Um, let's say he dies and you're, you just go into a depression and you can't talk to anybody and you get out of it 10 months from now. You can't disclaim. What happens to the money goes to you. If it's, you, let's say it's eight days and 29, eight months and 29 days and you wake up and you can move that quickly or realistically the estate attorney can move that quickly and you disclaim, then presumably whatever you disclaim goes next in line, which is presumably your kids. He, here's the reality of it. I am in no rush to make this disclaimer. You have nine months. I don't want somebody who's in this horrendous emotional state to be making important decisions, you know, right after a death. On the other hand, I don't like to drag it out. You know, the idea with estate planning, you know, same with burial get them in the ground or wherever they're gonna go, go through the grieving, whatever it is, and go on to the next thing. You, nobody wants an estate administration lasting years. And there's no reason for it. Most of the estate administration delay, it's not the client, fault of the client, it's the fault of the estate attorney. I hate that. Is it not disadvantageous for the spouse to disclaim IRA money? Because if she does it, you lose that 10 years of growth. Uh, with the Roth, that's correct. Not that you are regular IRA. 
she can keep it. She can take a minimum distribution to whatever is left that could go to them too. Um, well, so I'm going to rephrase. Can she keep it and then maybe make gifts? Yes, but that has different impl different tax implications than if she disclaims it. So a lot of times it makes a lot more sense for her to disclaim than rather than her keep the money and make a gift, which might end up ending up in the same place, but a lot of times there's a lot of advantages. The other thing is if she disclaims, in effect, the gift starts now, not at the time of the gift. And remember, you're, when you disclaim an asset, let's just say it's a million dollars of after-tax dollars, all right? Let's keep it real simple. Spouse disclaims $1 million of after-tax dollars, lives 10 years, and then dies. One, if they disclaim, let's assume it's invested at 7%. Now it's $2 million, so there's a lot more tax, all right? And maybe transfer tax. If nothing else, PA inheritance tax. That's an extra $45,000 inheritance tax, where if they disclaim, she gets the money out of the second estate. And the other advantage, which we'll talk about more, is the kids don't have to wait until they're 60 or 65 before they get any of your money. There was another question. Oh, there's a couple more. Go ahead. What, what, a, what a gentleman. <laughs> the, the, the 10-year um, requirement on the, the Security Act, taking out the money in here, distributing all the distributions within 10 years, does that apply regardless of whether it's first level, second level, third level, that whoever is the recipient, that, 10, that clock starts the same regardless of what level they're at? Uh, that's correct, but one of the things that you might end up doing is disclaiming to somebody who meets one of the exceptions. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm doing in my plan right now. So my father-in-law is 100 years old, all right? And for those of you who are following me, he's the one who is the inspiration for my articles on Take Your Family on a Family Vacation every year. All right, and a lot of you have heard that ad nauseum for me. It's one of the few areas where I've got people to spend more money. But anyway, he's 100 years old, he still has and my wife's share of his inheritance um, includes a $500,000 IRA, okay? So if we do nothing, he dies, she gets $500,000 of an IRA, we're in a high tax bracket now, that money comes out 10 years after his death, and all that whole $500,000 will be taxed at a high, high bracket, all right? But we also have this daughter who has a disability and that's one of the exceptions to the SECURE Act, she can stretch that over her lifetime. So our plan, he names his daughter as the primary beneficiary, but she, he names a special needs trust as the contingent beneficiary. He dies, my wife disclaims, the money goes into a trust, and that's stretched over her life expectancy at her tax rates, we're way better off, and frankly, that's one of our goals, not just to provide for us, but to pr provide for her. If we save that, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe it's not. Anyway, we save a lot of money, and we have helped fulfill our goal by having a transfer, in effect, from the IRS to our daughter. Okay? I'm gonna see if there's any other questions before you, Pothan because otherwise it would just be a conversation between us. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> if you have a real estate and it's all depreciated, it would behoove the surviving spouse to will that to the children so they can get the step up. All right, and the question is, can you disclaim and get a step up? Yes, in fact, that is a very, very cool part of our law. Right, right now we have something called a step up in basis. And it might, the reason why it's really cool in real estate is you can depreciate something. You can, let's say you buy a piece of real estate for a million bucks, right? Then you depreciate it, well, let's call it 100,000 for land. You depreciate 900,000. So now the basis is, 100, is 
is 100,000. That's the undepreciated amount. And let's say you sell it the day before you die. You, you have capital gain. You also have something called depreciation recapture. All right? Misery, misery. Example number two, you die, you leave it to your kids. They get what's called a step up in basis. So their basis is now a million bucks. Guess what? They get to depreciate it again. Is the government trying to stop this? And the government is certainly trying to stop it. And looking at you, I suspect that it's going to be gone before you are. All right. If you were 90, I might say you're probably okay with it. But it, let's put it this way. It's easier to tax dead people than alive people. All right, that's what they did with the SECURE Act. They're taxing, in effect, dead people. They need some money. That's, that's a, an easy way to do it. All right, go ahead. You were patient. And, uh, beneficiary for the IRA and other things, when you go to this uh, cascade plan, do we need to change there, or what is that? Well, the, the question is, how, how do you get this set up? And I'm not going to say this is the only way, but this is the way I would do it. I would change the beneficiary plan to, it would say, if I die, it goes to my wife. If my wife chooses to, dis to disclaim all or part of it, it goes to my kids equally. If my kids disclaim all or part of it, depending on which kid disclaims, it would go to a trust for the benefit of their kids, not the niece and nephew. Yeah, but do you need to change it in your 401k IRA? And the question is, if you want it to work optimally, and I'm not going to get into the nuances, should you change the beneficiary of your 401k? And the answer is yes. In fact, I'm just going to take a wild guess. For people who are still working and they have a big 401k plan, the beneficiary of that 401k is much more important than their will or their trust or anything else, because that's where the money is. Really? Yeah, I just assume that uh, uh, the uh, surviving spouse disclaims uh, a Roth IRA that is under his her husband's name. Okay. Now that Roth IRA will say a million dollar the Roth IRA, and the wife is disclaiming that, so that can go to the to one or more of the children right away. Yeah. In other words, they can transfer that right away. They don't wait for ten years to do that, right? No, they're not not allowed to transfer. Since it's a Roth IRA, it can be transfer to the inherited Roth? Yeah, but, the, yeah, but, it, but it's... And no, pay no taxes. Well, there's transfer taxes. Yeah, four and a half percent. Right. And, and, and dis, disclaiming a Roth IRA is not my favorite asset to disclaim because we're missing the ability for the spouse to have no minimum required distributions for the rest of their life. I, yeah, Roth IRA has no minimum distribution anyway. Right, for 10 years, but then after the spouse dies, it comes out in 10 years. If the spouse disclaims, it has, we're missing 10 years of tax-free growth by the spouse disclaiming. I, 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 can't, I can't argue with you, sorry. We have to move on. Any, anything else? Because I'm about to go into a new area. Can you make a trust beneficiary of an IRA or a 401k? I'm going to get to that specifically, so why don't, you, why don't we hold off? OK, so this is a new one. So even if you heard me as recently as two years ago, you didn't hear this strategy. Well, maybe three years ago, you didn't hear this strategy. This is not a tax law change. This is a, an aha for me. And when you're going to hear about it, you're going to say, well, why didn't you think of that 30 years ago, dummy? And you're absolutely right. And I call it who gets what. So most people, let's just keep it simple, husband, wife, two kids, grandkids. Most people would have the same beneficiary, even with a disclaimer, for all those assets. OK? I name my spouse, my kids equally, my trust for grandkids. And actually, there's, there's actually more uh, options. Because ultimately, think of your estate plan as a, as a pie. Okay, that's going to get divided up after you die. All right, and some of that pie, maybe the whole thing, is going to go to your spouse. Some of it, most likely through disclaimer, although you could just don't even give your, your spouse a choice. 
I leave X dollars in my IRA or X dollars outside or whatever to my kids equally. Okay, and by the way, one kid could be in the 12% bracket, one kid could be in the 32% bracket, but most people leave money to their kids equally. And then let's say to the grandkids. And by the way, you might be charitable. And by the way, it's a lot easier to be charitable at the second death than to give money either now or at the first death. So we have a lot of big bequests coming not now and not at the first death, but the biggest bequests are typically at the second death. And that makes sense. And I have that in my own documents. Um, but there's another beneficiary that we haven't talked about, and that's Uncle Sam. And particularly if we're talking about IRAs, Uncle Sam's gonna get a lot of money. So let's assume for discussion's sake that we want all these guys to get the most and we want Uncle Sam, it's pretty hard to get to zero, but let's say we want Uncle Sam, or for that matter, the PA Department of Revenue, to get as little as possible, all right? So that's what we're trying to do with who gets what. Um, we're trying to get a smaller slice for Uncle Sam and a bigger slice for everybody else. So let's just take something really charitable. All right, so um, why don't we pick on Joe for a minute? So Joe, he, he really wants to leave most of his money to his family, but he wants to leave some money to charity, whether it's whatever it is, the church, his favorite cause, the environment, animal, some money. But he wants to, he, he doesn't know, he, he wants to make sure that before he leaves a lot of money to charity that he's not gonna run out of money. And he wants to make sure that his wife doesn't run out of money. So he wants to leave $100,000 to the XYZ charity, but he doesn't want that to happen until after he and his wife are gone. Does that sound reasonable? Okay, so what 99 out of 100 attorneys would do, and frankly, up until a couple years ago, what I would do is we would say, okay, I leave everything, and we would do this in, in the will or the revocable trust, you know, I leave everything to my spouse, I leave $100,000 um, to the XYZ charity, and everything else goes to, let's say, your kids. Okay, does that seem reasonable for what I just said? Can we do better than that? No, I don't want to leave money to the charity before you're both... The, all right, we can do a charitable remainder trust, which is a lot of work. And by the way, I'm a big believer in those, but that's a topic for a different day. Something real simple. And on that $100,000 bequest, let's see if we can save $24,000 for Joe's kids. And I'll give you a hint. What's the name of this section? Who gets what? What if, instead of leaving $100,000 in are after-tax dollars to the charity, we leave $100,000 of our IRA to the charity. Does the IRA, does the charity care whether they get IRA money, after-tax dollars, Roth IRA? They don't care. Do your kids care? Oh yeah, because if you leave them $100,000 in an IRA, let's just keep it simple they're gonna to have to pay $24,000 in taxes. So what if we satisfy the $100,000 charitable bequest with the IRA through the IRA beneficiary designation? So we're changing who gets what. And what we really did is we cut out $24,000 from Uncle Sam and we transferred it to your kids. Well, that's pretty easy, right? Who would rather, who would rather their kids get an extra twenty-four thousand dollars, and their the IRS gets a hundred thousand dollars? I'm sorry, twenty-four thousand dollars less. Well, that's an easy call. Why didn't I think about that twenty years ago? Isn't that obvious? I mean, think about that. It's obvious. I I missed it all these years. And I didn't read about it, it just kind of occurred to me. I thought, well, that's kind of 
simple. All right, another situation. Let's say that we're gonna pick on, on Joe again. Let's say that Joe has two kids. All right, let's forget about grandkids for the moment. This one, he's a good kid, but he's one of these kids that never really got his career together, and he doesn't make a lot of money, and he's in the 12% tax bracket. All right, his other kid, you know, he's in the 34% bracket. But some people would change how much each kid gets. But Joe and his wife, they're kind of old school. We're gonna treat all our kids equally. Well, treating your kids equally doesn't mean treating your kids identically. I'm just gonna make up some numbers. Let's say that Joe has two kids. He has 1.4 million in an IRA. He has a million in a Roth IRA. What if, instead of saying, okay, $700,000 of the traditional goes to each kid, and the million dollars is also split 50-50, because that's what it probably is now. Each kid gets 50%. What if instead we name the kid who has the low income tax bracket, we ha get them the $1.4 million in the IRA, and we leave the kid who's in the high tax bracket a million dollars in the Roth IRA? Well, we might not have equalized exactly, but we saved what could be a couple hundred thousand dollars that would have otherwise gone to the IRS. You know, you're basically saving the difference in the tax brackets of half the amount. So that might be, you know, it doesn't really end up being 700,000 times um, 20, what, what would that be, 22%, but it's a lot. And it wasn't very hard to do. You know, that's no special trust, blah, blah, blah. That's just a simple, a simple change. Would I do this, you know, if you're gonna save $5,000? Eh, probably not. People would rather keep it simple. But if I can just do one little complication and save tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, I'm up for it. Would you be up for saving hundreds of thousands of dollars for a little bit of complication? Yeah, I would. Okay, um, the next couple slides are, are basically what I just said. I just did it off the top of my head, so I'm skipping through a couple slides. Okay, so why don't we take questions about that one now. Well, At what level would you make that choice? Is that a cascading piece? Um, so the question is at what level would we make it? We probably would include that in the cascade. So here's what we would do. We would say, I leave everything to my spouse. If my, let's say we're doing the beneficiary designation of the IRA. I leave everything to my spouse, but if my spouse disclaims, it goes to the kid in the low bracket. For the Roth, we say I leave everything to my spouse. If my spouse disclaims, then it goes to the kid in the high bracket. And by the way, we can do disclaimers for charity too. See, that's why you need an estate attorney who thinks, and hardly anybody does. This is. If, if, if you were a bunch of attorneys, I'm telling you, the people in this room would get this easier than the attorneys. And you think I'm kidding, I'm not. You know, for the last, I don't know, 20 years, I, you know, I, I drive to Harrisburg, and I, they, now you can do it on video, but they, they, they were set up many years ago to do a, what they called a simulcast. And the difference between that and a group of estate attorneys is you had a lot of people a lot of attorneys from small towns, and those guys were not only not specialists in IRAs, they didn't even specialize in estate planning. You know, they did wills and they did divorces and they did real estate and they did, you know, medical malpractice, they did everything, so they didn't do anything well. 
and this this idea that that would just blow them away. But isn't it fun to save hundreds of thousands of dollars by doing this much? <laughs> that's, that's to me, it's fun. <laughs> I mean, I like that, and it's real money. And again, I keep going back to numbers, and I measure in num numbers. But what if we measure in terms of anxiety, stress, quality of life, kids getting to go to a private or parochial school, living in a nice house, living in a nice neighborhood, not having the anxiety that our kids have. That works out a lot better. Okay, any more before I go on? Okay, um, I'll also just mention, um, if you are interested, at the end of this, I'm gonna give uh, an opportunity, um, not guaranteed, I have, to, I have to think that you're a good fit to work with us. And if I don't think that you're a good fit, or if I think that you're gonna be a pain in the butt, then, so I'm not guaranteeing a, a consultation. And the other thing, and what I told you before is very, very true. We're basically at capacity. You know, our, our, our limitation, because in order to do the kind of work that we do, I need a CPA with probably five to seven years experience doing tax returns, and then two years working with us. Well, I have three of those people, but I don't have 10. The, if we signed up for that, 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 that signing up is going to cover this also? Or? Oh, yeah. No, no, sign up one time. Okay, I didn't know if it was okay. No, it, the, the reality is I've been doing this for 40 years. I have, I have a bag of tricks, right? And I'm going to, it's not like, oh, you only signed up for this, so you only get this bag of tricks. No, you, you sign up for us, and we're going to try to do everything. You know, that's, and, and, and to me, I do it A, you know, it's good service, but I genuinely enjoy that. You know, I, I mean, you know, I, I don't play Parcheesi with my friends, I play bridge and chess, you know, so I like that kind of stuff. You know, it's, it's literally fun. I'll tell you what's very cool. If you've been doing it for 40 years and people come up to you, and I've actually had people come up to me today and said, well, you told me this, you know, way long ago, and I did it, and guess what? It worked. That's very cool. That's very cool. That's very satisfying. Um, and it's one of the reasons I keep doing this. I mean, I still like it. It's still fun. Not everything is fun, but a lot of it is. Okay, so if you are interested, fill this out, give it to Alice, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the details later. Okay, now we're gonna go on to trusts. And I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about the basics. In the old days, I used to talk about the, the advantages of avoiding probate. I'm not gonna do that. Um, but the trust can be, if you draft a trust, you can have the trust either be what's called a revocable trust, where typically you're gonna take some assets, we're gonna transfer it to the trust while you're alive. It's basically a will substitute. Or you could have a trust taken, you know, that takes effect at death, and that's called a testamentary trust. Um, a trust can be revocable, which means you can change it, or it can be irrevocable, which means you can't change it. The advantage of an irrevocable trust is then it's not in your estate when you die. The advantage of a revocable trust is if you change your mind, you can, you can change it. So if we don't need the tax benefits, then I'd much rather it be irrevocable. And since the main tax we're avoiding is actually transfer or estate tax, and since that's not nearly as important as income tax, we do a lot more revocable trusts than irrevocable trusts. Trust allows you to control from the grave, okay? So we really like that. And then there's trust for minors. Um, a trust can protect a minor from creditors, including the no good son-in-law. Um, it can protect against, a, let's call it a tort creditor, or even if your kid goes bankrupt. Um, it can protect your kid from themselves, from a spend, to be a spendthrift. Um, it can be used for a second spouse situation. 
health, maintenance, support, education, then at your death it goes to the kids. That's called an AB trust. I don't like those, but that is a very common trust. Um, for a minor's trust, you might say, well, health, maintenance, support, education, a third of 25, a third of 30, we terminate the trust at 35. So, again, we're gonna do the trust as, instead of naming the grandkids outright, you know, let's call it a big party at 21, we're gonna name trust for the benefit of the grandkids. Um, so, I'm gonna get a little bit touchy-feely here. So Carl Jung, the great psychologist, he says, even though we're, we all have a little bit of both in, in us, he says that most people are either judgers or free spirits. So what's a judger? A judger has certain views of the world. I'll be honest with you, I'm a judger. When you're young, you should get a job, you should max out your retirement plans. If you're married, you should have some insurance. You should be thinking of the future. You should you know, prefer, try to get into a house at some point. You should be doing Roth com contributions if you're older. You should be thinking about Roth IRA conversions. You should get your estate plan right. You should get your get. You know, I have certain ideas, okay? And what do I do in practice? I kind of promote these ideas because I think that they're good for you. So I'm a judger. I have certain ideas. This is the way the world should work. And I'm going to do everything I can to try to get the people who come under my influence to do this. We like to plan. Then there's the free spirits. They're going to conform their behavior to the world and what comes along. Well, whatever happens, you know, we're going to let the wind decide this. I'm a big believer in fate. It's already decided for me who, who, what's going to happen. Who here would say that they are more of a judger than a free spirit? Looks like most people. Do we have any free spirits? Okay, one, one, we have one free spirit. One husband's trying to go like this with his wife. <laughs> The free spirits are at the mall. They're not here. This room is mainly judges. Well, isn't a trust great for judges? We get to decide when our kids get the money, how they get the money, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of times we do use trust. And what are you doing? You're controlling from the grave. I, I do that in my own estate plan. Now, I kind of have to because I need a special needs trust for my daughter. But even, bef even before she developed this disability, I wasn't just going let it, to let it go and have the money go to my future ex-son-in-law. <laughs> you know, anyway, I, that's just the way I see the world. Okay, again, so that would be an example of a trust for an adult beneficiary. Um, there was a question. Can you make the beneficiary of an IRA a trust? The answer is yes, but, and the but is it has to be drafted correctly. And there's a lot of traps. There are five specific conditions that it has to meet in order to get the optimal tax benefit. And most attorneys, way more than half, botch it. So there was an article, let's see if this is coming up. All right, and the, the other problem with trust, um, you have to draft it right, you have to file a tax return, um, some kids need a trust, some don't. So there was an article in the Wall Street Journal that said if the underlying asset is an IRA, it's very complicated to name a trust as the beneficiary of your IRA, so therefore we recommend that you not leave your IRA to a trust. I'm thinking that's the stupidest advice I ever heard. What if your kid's a spendthrift? What if you want to protect from the no good son-in-law? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? Terrible advice. Instead of the advice don't name a trust as a beneficiary of the IRA, a better piece of advice is if the underlying asset is an IRA and a trust is the appropriate beneficiary, just find an estate attorney that knows what they're doing. 
but that's not what the article said. It was crappy advice. I <laughs> get on my computer, dear Wall Street Journal, you know, da -da -da -da, send it out. That I used to have a radio show. I am, um, by the way, a great learning experience because I actually, I actually read the books of the people I interviewed, and then I actually sent them the questions ahead of time. I'm not trying to zing somebody. Jack Bogle, who founded Vanguard and was the CEO of Vanguard, he told me I was the best prepared interviewer he ever had. And I thought, that's really sad, because he testifies in front of Congress and, and everybody else. But he was, he, and he came back. Um, and, and by the way, I have footage of that, of that interview, because I did one of them, we actually have a video of me interviewing him for an hour. Very cool guy, by the way. Um, one of my heroes. Um, but anyway, so I had this radio show, and that day I had an estate attorney named Bruce Steiner on the show. And, you know, I just, I usually a minute or two of chit chat thing, we got, we got into substance. Hi, Bruce, how are you? I'm furious. Well, what's the matter, Bruce? He said, the Wall Street Journal read an wrote an article today, and it said if the underlying asset is an IRA, that you shouldn't name an IRA, you shouldn't name a trust as the beneficiary of your IRA. Instead, you should name an individual. And that's such bad advice, because a lot of times you need a trust as the beneficiary of the IRA. And I was so mad, I wrote a letter to the Wall Street Journal. You think they published the letter? Either of our letters? No. No. But anyway, can, can you? Yes. Should you? Assume you need a trust. And by the way, we're always going to need a trust at this level. You know, um, I don't want this kid to have a party, you know, you know, when they're 21 years old. This is the no sex, drugs, rock and roll party at 21. <laughs> Maybe some people want that. Um, you can look at Mick Jagger, he's doing pretty well. Um, but anyway, what if there's marital strife? St um, strife? Well, that's another good reason that you want to have the money going to a trust instead of your kid. Undue influence, um, again, the no good son-in-law. Okay, uh, by the way, a prenuptial agreement is best, but bring it up too late, great way to start a family fight. I'll tell you a good time not to bring up a prenuptial. Your daughter brings home a guy with the nose rings and the tattoos and says, I want to marry him. I hope you're going to get a prenuptial. Well, you, it would be much better if you brought up the subject before he brings the guy home with the nose ring and the tattoos. OK? Sounds kind of like an old fuddy-duddy, but that's what I am. All right. so. Um, Let's do a little bit of a recap of, of what we've talked about and the next steps. So we talked about what I consider the best estate plan for most married couples, which is the beneficiary designation of, the, of everything um, being this cascading beneficiary plan or some variation thereof. We talked about who gets what. We talked about trust planning. All of these are very, very important that not very many estate attorneys get right. Um, and in the last session, we talked about the benefit of the financial master plan. I'm not going to go over again that, but remember your kids were $3.7 million better off in today's dollars by doing not all that many things right. And, and in that case, the status quo was not stupid. They, it just wasn't optimal. Okay, so, so I'm actually not going to go through that because I already did. But by the way, this is $3.7 in today's dollars. That's the difference. And this is your kids. So here, you're, di you're dying when your kids are 65. This is where your kids are when they're in their 80s. Allow me to ask you some important questions. Do you want to protect yourself and your family from massive income tax acceleration? Are you at least slightly concerned that future income and other tax increases will unnecessarily decimate your hard-earned savings and threaten the financial legacy you plan to pass on to your children and grandchildren? Are you willing to take action and defend yourself from government confiscation of your hard-earned money? Are you ready to take proactive steps that could help you and your heirs get the most out of what you've got? If you answered yes, 
This short video could be the most important thing you have ever watched. Imagine you could wave a magic wand and have a rock-solid financial master plan that has all your financial affairs in order. Think about how you would feel if you never had to worry about money because you had solid data that allowed you to make informed financial decisions, not guesses. How much better would you sleep at night knowing your financial master plan is in place? I'm going to share with you how you can make that happen. But first, let's talk about why it's so crucial to develop and implement your holistic, long-term retirement and estate plan. First, thanks to the sunsetting of the rates set by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, it's likely that your current income taxes will go up in 2026. But even if legislation is passed to enshrine the current rates before they expire, Raising income tax rates isn't the only way to raise taxes. Jim Lang predicted the death of the stretch IRA and advocated defenses against it more than five years before the SECURE Act became law. Jim had the foresight that almost no other retirement and estate planning experts did. He understood that the end of the preferential tax treatment of inherited IRAs and retirement plans wasn't a matter of if, it was a matter of when. Now Jim predicts higher capital gains tax rates, changes to federal tax exemptions, elimination of step-up in basis rules, and estate tax increases. Congress pulled a bait and switch on you, and it was just plain wrong. You were promised that contributions to your IRAs and retirement plans would pass to your heirs with significant tax advantages. Remember the stretch IRA? Because you're fiscally responsible, you acted on that promise. You sacrificed so you could put as much money as you could into your retirement plans. Then, late in the game, Congress pulled the rug out from under you by passing the SECURE Act. The consequence of Congress's actions with the SECURE Act? A massive income tax acceleration on money you thought was protected. But there is a way for you to fight back and protect your wealth from the Congress's greedy hands. We can offer you the means and the tools to pull back some of that money. There is no single strategy that will solve all these problems and ensure your future financial security. Nor is there a one-size-fits-all combination of strategies that is right for everyone. But Jim and his team will help you find the right combination for you and your family. Here are just a few of the strategies in Jim's arsenal. A series of timely Roth IRA conversions to be executed over a number of years. Social security optimization. Lifetime safe spending analysis. Spend the right money first analysis, appropriate asset location analysis, estate plan evaluation, lifetime and testamentary gifting strategy, including leveraging lifetime gifts to children and grandchildren, and our tax savvy who gets what estate planning analysis. And all of these will be adapted to your unique situation and calibrated to provide the best results for you and your family. The choice to develop your financial master plan is not a choice to maintain the status quo. It's a proactive choice to improve upon the status quo and secure the future you dream of for yourself and your family. When you meet with Jim, he may propose implementing the superbly flexible Lang's Cascading Beneficiary Plan. Its flexibility protects your spouse, allows for the possibility of directing money to your children after the first death, and allows for the possibility of directing money to your grandchildren with parents as trustees. These options are not available with traditional planning. Lang's Cascading Beneficiary Plan is really an estate planning system that should be considered for virtually all of your assets. It works for wills and revocable trusts, IRAs and retirement plans, Roth IRAs, and Lang's Cascading Beneficiary Plan is only one tool in Jim's arsenal. The first step toward peace of mind and a good night's sleep is to request a Retire Secure consultation with Jim Lang. During your one-hour private Zoom consultation with Jim and one of his number-crunching CPAs, you'll discover how to cut your taxes and preserve your wealth. Jim will answer all your questions and concerns and likely suggest two or more tax-reducing strategies you had not thought about. Jim takes a multidisciplinary approach to securing your retirement. He accounts for taxes, legal, and investments. Jim has given thousands of consultations over the years, 
and has never had anyone say or even imply that it wasn't worth their time. Why? Because Jim delivers real-world value and not a sales pitch. At the end of your Retire Secure consultation, you will have the outline for a concrete plan of action to maximize your retirement prosperity and generational wealth. Then, you will have three options. You will thank Jim for his time and valuable recommendations and most likely end up doing nothing. You'll want Jim and his team to run full retirement and estate planning projections, producing your personalized financial master plan for a one-time investment of between $12,500 and $22,500, depending on the complexity of your situation. Or you'll want your personal financial master plan, and you'll want Jim's team to help you implement the plan and have one of Jim's strategic partners manage at least a portion of your assets. If you select option three, your personal financial master plan is included for free and your personal financial master plan will be updated every year at no additional cost, provided you place a minimum of $2 million under management. A no-obligation retire secure consultation will likely provide you with at least one idea worth 10 or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can get it now for free, without obligation. The purpose of the Retire Secure consultation isn't to sell you. It is to determine if you are the right fit to work with Jim and his team. Please note that Jim will not take you on as a client unless he thinks he can save you and your family many times his fee. Jim only has a limited number of slots available for the free Retire Secure consultation before there is a waiting list. Since Jim personally conducts each consultation, and there are hundreds of attendees on this virtual event, Jim will almost certainly not have enough available appointments to meet demand. In addition, Jim's team will likely not have sufficient time to meet demand for financial master plan development. Developing each financial master plan is a time and labor intensive process. And with ongoing obligations to existing clients, Jim and his CPAs only have so much capacity to take on new clients. So, to secure your free Retire Secure consultation with Jim Lang, click the offer link and complete the appointment request form now. Listen, with the uncertainty in the country, it's natural to be concerned about your financial future. But with proper planning, you can protect yourself and your family from massive taxation, get the most out of what you've got, and maximize retirement prosperity and generational wealth. And the first step is simple and free. Click on the offer link and request your Retire Secure consultation with Jim Lang. Don't wait and be disappointed. A happier, less stressful, and more abundant life awaits. Take action to secure your family's financial future now. Request your free Retire Secure consultation by clicking on the offer link.